Hi, this is Galaxy vs. C-Max, and this is going to be the last technical video about the build of the 1962 Ford Galaxy 500XL Sunliner to see if it can outrun my 2014 Ford C-Max plug-in hybrid, which I'm actually, at this point I've driven the Galaxy, I don't know if that's going to happen, but at least we'll see how much faster the Galaxy is now than where it was before. And here's the last part. This is the camshaft. The camshaft that came in the Galaxy is actually the one I'm holding in my hand. And because my car's a 1962, it has the pre-1963 cam retainer. And that was the first thing I wanted to talk about, specifically for this engine. What makes this different is this retainer than all the other camshafts you can buy from Edelbrock, Camp Cam, Comp Cams, everybody else, are the 63 and later. So this retainer keeps the cam from going too far into the block. And then once you put on the timing chain, that thing, and the fuel pump eccentric on the end of this, there is a fairly high tension spring and a little metal button on it. And that button rides against the timing chain cover and keeps the camshaft from coming out. You can retrofit, go buy a 63 later cam and retrofit it to use a retainer plate, which is gonna look something like this. Um, this is actually from a small block Ford. This is what you get 63 and later. This is what you get on a 62. And had I known that, I would have gone and retrofitted this. Anyway, the old cam. This cam factory at 50 thousandths lift was 186 degrees of duration on the intake and exhaust. And the uh, load lift was 0.398. So under four, I mean, just slightly, but that's really small. And the duration's really small too. And the cam I put in isn't actually that much bigger. I mean, it's bigger than this. Look at, I mean, you gotta really look close to even see lobes on this thing. It's that small. This thing was really choked down. So the cam I put in is from Oregon Cam Grinders. And what they actually do is they weld onto the lobes and regrind them. So they can take a cam core uh, I didn't use mine because I wanted to keep this. I kept all the lifters numbered where they're supposed to go so they can match right back up to this. Um, and it's actually pretty cheap for them to take a core off their shelf and regrind it. So you really get to pick exactly what camshaft you want. Off the shelf they have a ton of grinds available where you can just say, give me that one. And I think I picked a 60 or 61. I don't know exactly, but I do know the numbers on it. The intake is 192 degrees at 50 thousandths and the exhaust is 196. And for the lift, it's 453 intake and 465 exhaust. So that's still a really mild, small cam. It's just quite a bit of an improvement from this one, especially in the lift department. Now the reason I picked a cam, that specific cam, was because the compression in my 62 was 8.9 to 1 which is fairly low compression. Now, if you leave on a high duration cam, you leave the intake valve open longer after the piston starts coming up. And that reduces your, they call dynamic compression. What's your actual effective compression from when the intake valve actually closes to the top? And what I came up with with this cam is I was getting about 7.7 to one compression ratio with this duration and I didn't want to go any longer than that because you start losing that compression which on high rpm you can make that up but this engine isn't going to do that. The parts I picked, the intake, that Autolite 4100, this is still an under 5200 rpm car so the camshaft had to match that and that's the number I would really be looking at. Look at when the cam closes. And you can go online and find a calculator to find your dynamic compression ratio. The one I use is Wallace Racing, Wallace Racing Engines, and I think they're Pontiac guys. But it's really easy. You put in a few parameters about your engine, and it kicks out a dynamic compression ratio. And what you want to target on the low end for a pretty soft engine is about 7.5 to 1 dynamic. And unless you have a professional engine builder and they're measuring every single thing you don't really want to go over maybe 8.3 unless you're using higher octane fuel than 91 octane that we get around here so uh that's the information on my cam why i picked the cam and what went in my engine 
So next, I'm going to show you some basics on tuning the engine now that we have it running. So my balancer had good marks for where 10, 20, and 30 degrees were, but it was really hard to tell what top dead center actually was when the thing's turning around for timing it, and no marks beyond 30. So what I did was I marked my 10, 20, and 30, and got the distance in between those, and then copied that to go to, uh, this will be top dead center, and then I'm going to divide that, since that's 10 degrees, by 10, multiply by 6, and I'll make another mark for 6 degrees. I have this tape on the balancer so it follows a curve, and then I'll tape, tape it back up there and transfer marks for 12 degrees and 36 degrees onto the balancer. So here you can see the timing tape on the balancer. I'm going to make some white marks with some white nail polish for 36 12 and top dead center and then go to time it. Now here's a setup for tuning for RPM. I have a dwell tack meter that I'll be using to check my RPM. I have a vacuum gauge here and a timing light here. Now the vacuum gauge is how I'll be setting the air fuel mixture at idle. I'll look for the highest number I can get out of that. I'm going for about 17 or 18 inches, I presume here. And then the timing light, I will just set base timing. Some people go by vacuum gauge two on timing and I don't like that. Um, your engine might make best vacuum at idle at say uh, 16 degrees. Now if your distributor adds in another 30 degrees of centrifugal advance, you're at 46 and you're probably going to damage the engine. So set it with a light, I'm going to set uh, initial timing at around 12 and then go look at total timing and looking for about 36. And then because I don't have the distributor recurved, which I should do eventually, I'm going to try to find the happy medium where I have about what I want at initial and about what I want on the full end because without changing the distributor, you can't really pick the spread between those numbers. So what you need for setting the timing is the vacuum advance line disconnected and plugged. You need a chalk behind your tires, your parking brake set, and a lovely assistant to sit with the actual brake on uh, because it needs to be in gear, go with reverse, so if something does happen, it doesn't run you over. And uh, if you want, I'll do a short little story, too, on why you should always do that and have somebody with you or else things go badly. So I ended up being able to set the base timing at 14 degrees, which was a little more than what I wanted, uh, but the idle was higher, too, so that centrifugal advance is already coming in. It's idling at about, in gear, 650 RPM, which, as the specs go, higher than the 352 should have, lower than what the performance 390 should have. So that's a performance 390 intake, shooting for right in between there. And I had about 16 inches of vacuum. I actually got a little more if I advanced the carburetor a little more, but I didn't want to do that. I was coming up with about 34 degrees on the top end of total centrifugal advance. A little below the 36, but that was the happy medium that I could get with the distributor without it being recurved. So now everything is tuned up. The engine should be all ready to go make its best performance and we can see what its new zero to 60 time. Look for that next week.